Welcome again to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Carter from Wageningen University in Gofsigold. This is the sixth webinar in the Red Plus Monitoring and Measurement, Reporting and Verification Training the Trainers series, sponsored by the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility with support from our partners. It's great to see so many people online who have joined us today for the webinar. Today's webinar is on accuracy assessments related to area estimates and our speakers for today are from Boston University and the FAO. For more information on the webinar series and for web links to the materials relevant for today's webinar, please visit the Gofsi Gold webpage which is written on this slide. By the end of the week, the recording of this webinar will also be available on our website. Today's webinar will last for around one and a half hours. After a short introduction, we will have presentations by Pontus Olufsen, Associate Professor from Boston University and author of a number of publications and guiding, guidance materials on today's topic. And Remy Denunzio, Forestry and Remote Sensing Expert in the FAO, who has been involved in the development of the tools which will be presented today. Following the presentations, we'll have a two-minute break where you can post your questions in the question box on the webinar control panel. And then after the break, the presenters will answer your questions. You can post your questions during the presentations at any time, so please feel free to do that. So those of you who have been following the series from the beginning, apologies that you've already seen this slide a number of times, but for those who are new to the series, I'd like to just briefly put today's webinar into the context of Red Plus MRV and our webinar series. So this slide shows some tools and methodologies which can help you negotiate the Red Plus MRV process. And the orange numbers represent the webinars which we've presented. We include tools which will be presented in the series in this slide, but of course there are other tools and methods available. To catch up on the previous webinars, you can watch the video recordings on our website. Today's webinar will demonstrate uh, CEPAL, a cloud computing platform, in terms of how it can be used for accuracy assessments. You can see this, um, it's webinar number six on the slide. And next week, we'll explore some other functions of CEPAL in terms of accessing, managing, and analyzing data. And that will be the last in our series. That's number seven. So we started the webinar series with the Red Compass, which is the base of how we're structuring our series, as all the activities demonstrated in the webinar series can be recorded in the Red Compass. So for those of you who are using the Red Compass, um, you can see the main activities which we're going to cover today um, on this uh, part of the pyramid. This is the measurement and estimation part of the Red Compass. And you can also see the Gofsi Gold training module. Um, that's module 2.7, um, which also provides information on this topic. So please do check that out on our website. There's also a very useful video lecture from Boston University. Um, which gives a good introduction to the topic, which you can watch. Okay, so I'm delighted to now hand over to our two speakers. Um, Pontus, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, All right, this seems to work. Great. Um, and thank you. I see there's 133 people online, which is great. Um, and the way we're going to do this is I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of this and, and um, the background of estimation and statistical inference in a, in a geography context. And, and uh, talk a little bit about the different articles that we have written and the international guidelines and, and stuff like that. And then Remy is going to demo um, the FAO CEPAL application for how to actually implement an unbiased stratified estimator for estimation of, of area and accuracy. So I will talk more about the background and the theory, and, um, and Remy will. will, will show an application of that. Um, I'll also keep this at a, at a pretty introductory level, so um, 
you know, if, if you don't have any degrees in math or statistics, then don't worry about it. We will, we, will, we will keep it at a very introductory level. And I think, in general, before I start, I would like to say that, too, that you don't need to be a statistician or a mathematician to, to do these kinds of things. If you're a geographer and you made a map, and your objective is to estimate, let's say, the area of, of deforestation or the area of, of cropland or the area of something, implementing an unbiased estimator and actually estimating the area rather than just counting pixels in the map, it's fairly straightforward. And what I'm trying to do, and others as well, is, is to provide guidance and, and tools and recommendations for how to do that. And, and I think that's important to, to know before we start. Um, to my students, I sometimes say that this is, like, this is like driving a car. You don't need to be a mechanic. You don't need to be able to take apart the car and put it back together in order to drive a car. And this is kind of the same thing. You don't need to have all the, the full background and mathematical, statistical um, knowledge in order to, to implement an estimator. Um, but I just wanted to say this before we get started, because sometimes this, this topic can be a little bit intimidating, and, and I don't want it to be intimidating. I'm trying to make it um, accessible and, and demystify it a little bit. So, an important question to, to answer before we get started, too, is, is why even bother with this? I think it's a very fair question that if you have made a map, why can't we just use that map as is? Why can't we just count the pixels that are classified as something? Why do we have to go through this, this estimation protocol? Why do we have to implement this protocol in the estimators? Well, the reason for that is that the map will always have errors. You can never assume that a map is error-free. And I don't think there's ever been a map produced that is error-free. <clears throat> and, and that is one of the weaknesses of, of classifying remote sensing data. The, good, the, the, the benefit of that, the strength of remote sensing, is that it gives us a full coverage of our study area. And there is really no other way to get that. You know, we could sample things, but if you want like a spatial representation of your study area, the only way to get that is, is via remote sensing, in one way or the other, various remote sensing data. So therefore, remote sensing is a very powerful tool, and that's the reason why we're using it. And, and the data is, the remote sensing data is getting getting more and more abundant, more and more accessible, higher and higher quality, and higher and higher quantity. So this is something that is increasing in importance, too. But as it's increasing in importance, we then also need to be aware that any map will have errors. And if the map has errors, it means that we can't just count the pixels classified as a certain category. Those areas will not be correct because of classification errors. So what we need to do is to implement an estimator that somehow takes those classification errors into account. And if we can do that, we, we do that, I should say, by applying an estimator to sample data. And we can then also apply a variance estimator to estimate a confidence interval around those areas. So that's the main motivation behind this. Remote sensing results are never perfect. You will always have errors. And if you have errors in your map, you can't just count the pixels mapped as, as, as a certain category. They will be incorrect because of these classification errors. So therefore, we need to obtain a sample, apply an estimator to the, that sample, and estimate the confidence interval around the estimates. And, and another motivation for this is that within the whole UNFCCC Red Plus context, 
we're relying on the IPCC to provide the good practice guidelines. And, and back in 2003, uh, the great Jim Penman wrote that the greenhouse gas inventories reported within these treaties should neither over nor underestimate as far as can be judged. And he said that the uncertainties need to be reduced as far as practicable. Right? So if you want to reduce the uncertainty, you first have to estimate it. So these two criteria are very important. And, and if you're doing anything within Red Plus or, or UNFCCC, you need to make sure that your reporting is IPCC compliant. And that means adhering to these two criteria. So the first criterion relates to the concept of bias. That is, no one nor underestimates. That relates to the concept of bias. In theory, bias is the property of an estimator. An estimator is just a simple mathematical formula that we apply to sample data. And the reason we can say that an estimator is unbiased is because we can mathematically prove it. We can prove that the mean value of sample data collected by random sampling is an unbiased estimator of a population parameter because it's fairly easy to show that mathematically. So the estimator is the one that is unbiased. It's the mathematical formula that is unbiased. And if we apply that estimator to sample data, we get an estimate. And that is what we want. An estimate that, that doesn't have any bias in it, as opposed to the areas we get from counting pixels in the map. That's the first criterion. The second criterion, uncertainties need to be reduced as far as practicable, and which means that they need to be estimated. Even an unbiased estimator will give you an estimate that might deviate quite a bit from the true value. There might be an inherent large variance or uncertainty in that estimate. And we like to quantify or express that uncertainty using a confidence interval. And that we obtain by applying a variance estimator. And I'm sure Remy will show all of this later. So I've been working a lot with, within an organization called Silva Carbon, which is the United States government capacity building program that includes the US Forest Service, the US Geological Survey, and NASA. And so we've been working with countries, trying to we we'll, we'll work together with countries to to advance the reporting of of so-called activity data or 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 land cover change in support or, or in support of of Red Plus. And so in order to achieve these, in order to report meeting these criteria. Um, and, and, and implement the whole estimation protocols, we make use of books that's been around for quite a long time. Um, Remy is later going to talk about something called stratified estimation, which is explained in, in the book to the left here, Sampling Techniques, by William Cochran at Harvard University. That's a very old book. This is the third edition shown here from 1977, but the first edition, I think, is from the 50s. Um, Another estimator, which is called a model-assisted estimator, is explained in Sandow's book from 1991. Um, so these books and this theory has been around for quite a long time. This is nothing new, and it's not something that I've come up with at all. But these books don't make any mention at all of maps or remote sensing or anything like this. They just provide, they just provide the, the underlying theory. So. What me and a lot of other people have done is to try to take that theory and apply it to a geography context. And, and again, I'm not the only one doing this. And, and even the papers that I wrote, I didn't do it myself. But you can see here, there is one paper that I wrote in 2013, which explains the use of stratified estimation for estimation of accuracy in area and for quantification of uncertainty. Um, 
This is just kind of the analysis and the construction of the stratified estimator. I wrote another paper in 2014 which provides practices, good practices and recommendations for the whole protocol, including sampling design and stuff like that. Um, there are other papers, uh, Ron McRobert at the US Forest Service had written a few papers on the use of model-assisted estimation. Uh, Eric Nesset has one paper down here. Um, so there's, there's a lot of these papers around, and um, I'd also like to, I really like the title of Ron's paper here from 2011. It says, Satellite Image-Based Maps, Scientific Inference or Pretty Pictures, and the case he's making is that if you don't make any inference, if you don't construct these estimators, the maps are really just pretty pictures, and, and it's hard to make any scientific inference from them. Um, so me and a lot of our people have written these, these papers, and we all came together and, and provided international guidelines regarding, these, um, regarding this topic, the Mets and Guidance document of GFOI. So GFOI is the Global Forest Observation Initiative, which is, a, which is an initiative under GEO. The Silva Carbon is the capacity building pillar of, of, of GFY. And another pillar is the methods and guidance document. And we see here the version version one and version two. Version two was released in 2016. So so me and, and Ron and Eric Nesset, Steve Stamen and others, we, we came together and sat down and 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 agreed on a couple of, of recommendations and guidelines regarding estimation. So, before I talk more about that, just a very simple example of inference, for those of you who are not familiar with this. So, the idea here is that we have a large population, and the population could be all the pixels of a certain country, it could be all the people in a certain country, it could be something very large that it's too hard for us to analyze. What we do is that we obtain a sample, a subset of that population that represents the population. And then we can analyze just that small sample and we can make inference, we can draw conclusions about the larger, pre about the larger population. So one, one example that I think most of us are familiar with is how we estimate the number of votes prior to an election for a political party or a presidential candidate. This is, a, this is a very, very common example of statistical inference that, that I think we're familiar with. If you have an election in, in any given country, um, the only time we get a full census, so to say, of the population is, is on election day. But before that, we want to know um, we want to know the approximate number of votes that, that the political parties or candidates are going to get. And we can't ask every single voter who they're going to vote for. We only do that during election day. So instead what we do is that we select, by certain rules, a subset of people, maybe a thousand people, 500 people or so, and then we ask them who they're going to vote for. And if we can make sure that that sample represents the population, we can then draw inference or make inference about the larger population who they're going to vote for. For example, let's say that we select a simple random sample of 500 voters. Simple random sample means that if we have a country of 10 million people, it's like we take each of these, well, each eligible voter in this, in this country, and we put their names in a, in a box, and we randomly just select 500 people. 500 names. It's a simple random sample of 500 voters. And then what we do is that we ask each one of them, who are you going to vote for? Who are you going to vote for? We're going to vote for candidate A, B, or C. Or let's make it simple. Let's say we have just two political parties or two political candidates. So you're going to vote for candidate A or candidate B. And then we count how many votes each candidate get. And that's our sample data. That's our sample data. 
So now we have to apply an unbiased estimator to the sample data. And the estimator corresponds to the sample design. So in this case, we have a simple random sampling design. Therefore, our estimator has to be a simple random estimator. And it turns out that the arithmetic mean of our sample, the expected value of the mean of our sample data equals the population parameters, the population parameter, which means that this is an unbiased estimator because we can show what is in parentheses here. The expected value of the mean equals the population parameter. So if we apply this to sample data, it's Obama here, but it could be anything. Um, we have the estimate of the population parameters, and we indicate that it's an estimate with this little hat. We just take the mean. So here is the first voter in our sample. We ask them, are, who are we going to vote for, Obama or somebody else, or the other guy? And he said, yes, I'm going to vote for Obama. OK, so we put down a 1. And then we ask the second person, and he also going to vote for Obama. The third person is not. And we just add all of that together and divide by the total number. That's the mean value. And that mean value, in this case, let's say it's 0.51. So we can infer that 51% of the population is going to vote for Obama. We have now applied an unbiased estimator to our sample data. And again, we can show that this mean value this expression is an unbiased estimator of the population mean. That will give us an estimate. So the second step here is then to, to quantify a confidence interval around that estimate. And we typically do this by calculating a so-called 95% confidence interval. And that means that nine, if, if we do this exercise over and over again. So we select randomly 500 people um, and we construct a confidence interval around each of those sets of sample data. 95% of those intervals will include a true value. So that is different than saying that it's a 95% probability that the interval includes the true value. It's a slightly different interpretation. And this is typically how we express uncertainty in our estimates. And in this case, it's fairly straightforward. We have to calculate the variance and the standard error, and then we multiply that with, with a certain score that corresponds to the distribution. So in this case, we have our so-called variance estimator. And we, again, indicate that by letter V, and we have a hat above. So the variance of our estimate, again, very simply, simple calculation. We have our estimated uh, mean, which is 0.51. So we had to take the first voter who said, yes, I'm going to vote for says a 1 minus 0.51 squared. And then we add all of those squares together and we divide by 500 minus 1. That will give us a variance of 0.003. We get a confidence interval by multiplying the standard error, which is just the square root of the variance, times the C-score, which in this case is 1.96 for 95% confidence. We get a confidence interval of 0.11. So now we have an estimate of 0.51 plus minus a 95% confidence interval of 0.11. Sometimes what we do, and I don't think it's here, we can calculate a margin of error, which is just simply the confidence interval divided by the mean which in this case would then be 0.11 times divided by 0.5, 
which is roughly 20%. So we say that we have a 20% margin of error in this case. This is a very simple example of how we can estimate, make inference about a very large population by analyzing sample data. And again, this is a very simple example as where we resort to simple random sampling. In a real life scenario, you're going to have large variance among various demographic groups. Right? There's going to be large variants, you know, in the US, for example, there is very large variance between um, where people live. People in the northeastern United States vote very differently from people in the south. Um, ethnicity, educational background, a lot of different things come into play when we do these things. So what we might want to do is to stratify our sample. Right? So we identify these different strata, these different subgroups of the population, and then we sample those individually. And we can then increase the precision. This, this confidence interval will hopefully go down if we do that. And I think the point I want to make here is that the task of doing this, which we're all familiar with, familiar with is, is, is very similar to, to estimating activity data, or estimating the amount of deforestation in a country over a certain time period, or, or any map category for that matter. Really the same thing, and again, the textbook that I was referring to, like Cochrane 1977, doesn't really make any distinction between the applications. So it doesn't talk about um, doesn't talk about maps and stuff. It just kind of outlines the theory for how to do these things. So. Before we move forward, let's introduce some terminology. So the, the workflow is, is that we first have to select a sample. So in the example I showed, we resort to a simple random sample, but there's a lot of different ways to, to select our, our, our sample. So this is the first thing we got to do. We have to design our sample. So that includes picking a sampling design and then determining how many sample um, units do we need. And, and how, if we do a stratified sample, how are we going to allocate them in the different strata? Um, if we do, you know, a more complicated thing like a, a two-stage cluster sample, we have to decide the size of the primary sampling unit and decide the secondary sampling unit and so forth. So this is a very important step of the workflow, designing the sample. And we're trying to answer the question, where will we collect so-called reference observation? So in our case, we don't ask voters. We don't have any voters. The example I showed, we're asking voters who they're going to vote for. In this case, we analyze pixels to try to determine what the reference conditions are on the land surface. So does, does this pixel really experience deforestation or did it not? Or whatever land surface um, dynamics we're interested in. So what we do, instead of asking voters, we analyze the land surface to collect so-called reference observations of land surface conditions. And we do that by inspecting reference data. So the reference data might be high resolution data, it might be Landsat data that we manually or typically we manually inspect the data for the collection of the reference data. And then the collection of these reference observations, that's our sample data. So instead of having sample data that says, yes, I'm going to vote for candidate A or I'm going to vote for candidate B, we will have sample data that says, Yes, this pixel experienced deforestation, this one did not, this was stable forest, so on and so forth. And the final part of this is that we analyze it. This is where we construct our estimators and apply it to the sample data. This is where we make our inference of the population by analyzing it. The sampling is on, there are many options. The first and, and most you know, obvious option is just simple random sampling. Right? We just randomly select the locations, 
or in the case of voters, we don't randomly pick voters. We don't care about anything else. We don't care about, you know, in this case, we have a map of, of the whole continent of Africa. And we, in this case, we don't care what the map says. In this case, we have something that is dark red. We have something that is bright yellow. There is stuff that is green. We don't care about that. We just randomly select the, the pixels or whatever. Let's say pixels for simplicity. Uh, we just randomly select it. We don't care what the map says. We can do something very, very similar, which is a simple systematic sample. So here we just randomly pick a location, and then we select neighbors from that at the fixed at in this case, the, the, the horizontal and the vertical distance should be the same. I think these graphics here is a little bit truncated. So it looks like the, the, the horizontal distance is shorter, but it shouldn't be. It should be the exact same. It's a simple systematic sample. It's very, very similar to simple random sampling. It's analyzed the same way. Um, something a little bit more interesting is stratified random sampling. So here we actually make use of the underlying map information. So in this case, let's say we're interested in the dark red stuff here in the map. If we do a simple random sample, we might get a few observations in the red part here of the map, but very, very few. And so we're going to need a very large sample to get a good representation of this red stuff. If we stratify, if we stratify the landscape here, stratify the continent of Africa using this map information, we can target these areas that we're interested in. So in this case, we're obviously interested in the red stuff, so we can make sure that we get a sample that represents these areas. So stratified random sampling is usually a very powerful um, sampling design, especially in the context of like red plus and such, because um, if we're trying to estimate land cover change, such as deforestation or forest regeneration, it's typically a very, very small part of the landscape. Um, so in order to get a good statistical representation of that, we do typically want to stratify based on map information. So the map, in that case, becomes very important. Right? In simple random sample, simple systematic sample, we're not really using the map. We don't need a map. You know, the map is, is, is not terribly important, unless we do something called post-stratification, which, which is a different topic. Um, so even in those cases, the map might be very important. Um, but it's clearly it directly important here in the stratified random case. Because it might, if, if it's a good map, it's an accurate map, it might, it, it's going to do a good job highlighting or showing us where the areas of activities are, such that we can sample it. So we can get an estimate with a much smaller sample size compared to the simple, simple random and systematic cases. We can do this more complicated too by doing a, we're doing, for example, a cluster-based sample or a two-stage cluster sample. So we first select these uh, primary sampling units, and then we we sample within these primary samples. Um, so there are some obvious benefits of that, and that is if we want to collect reference data, high-resolution imagery, for example, we only need to do that over these primary sampling units. A couple of drawbacks with that, and I'll refer you to the literature to if you're more interested about that. So again, the basic sampling design questions. I'm not sure how much we're going to go into this. If you want to know more about this, I wrote about this in my 2014 paper. You have to decide whether you want to use strat or not. Typically, yes, you do. You want to cluster the sample. Um, yeah, you probably don't, but sometimes it's a good idea and selection protocol. The response design, this is a little bit vague maybe in the, in the geography context. This makes a lot of sense in the, in the voter example. You have to design the response protocol, which includes like formulating which question are we going to ask. So in, the, in, in, in the example I showed before, the response protocol might be a formulaire or questionnaire asking 
you know, are you going to vote? Do you plan to vote for candidate A? Do you plan to vote for candidate B in the upcoming election? It's fairly straightforward. In our case, it's a little bit more complicated. We're going to have to somehow find reference data that allow us to collect uh, reference observations. We typically do that. We don't want to know any map information about that class. And again, there's a lot to say about this. And uh, again, I wrote about this in the 2014 paper. There's other uh, papers written about this too. What we have found in, in, in the work that I've been doing, that time series of Landsat data is, is a very powerful reference data set. This, this is a tool that we developed at BU that allows you to, to display time series of Landsat observations. So in this case, we have all the Landsat surface reflectance observations from January 2001 to 2005. And we're looking here at band 5, so short for infrared reflectance. And don't, don't worry about the, don't ignore the big yellow um, thing there, but if you can see, there's a little red square. That's our sample pixel. In this case, it looks very much like stable forest. And we see this as a very, very low reflectance. If there was any disturbance in the forest cover, we would expect an increase in, in surface reflectance in the short wave infrared part of the spectrum. But we don't see that. So this is so clearly a stable forest. If we could combine this with some high resolution data, we'd have a pretty powerful um, data set. You know, but a very, very good data set is like a forest inventory where people actually go to the field to collect these reference observations on a regular basis. That's a very powerful data set. If you don't have that, then, then, um, then we typically have to resort to satellite data. Then the analysis, this is when we analyze the sample data. And, and typically what we do is that we estimate accuracy and we estimate area. Accuracy is just simply, you know, how well does the map agree with reference conditions? Calculate overall accuracy, user's accuracy, and producer's accuracy. Um, and of course, as I talked before, area estimation is typically our primary importance. Um, I mean, accuracy is, is important too, but, but often what we're doing is just to show that the map isn't correct. And, and, and if you want to use the map to, to obtain any areas, we still have to estimate the areas, even if it's very accurate. We can take a very simple example. Let's say you have a map. Let's say you have a study area that is, that is mainly forest. It's just intact forest, except for like 2% that's been deforested. If you make a map where you say that every single pixel is forest, right? so every single pixel has the same value, it's a completely useless map. The map is completely useless. It doesn't tell you anything. It's still 90% accurate. The overall accuracy is still 98%, because you got 98% of the pixel wrong. You only missed out on a 2% deforestation. Um, so, so accuracy measures are sometimes problematic. Uses and produces accuracy are typically a little bit more interesting than, than overall accuracy. So I only have a few minutes left here, but, but typically the way we do the analysis is that we cross-tabulate the reference observations and the map observations. In this case, we have a very, very simple map. We have forest loss, and we have not loss, so everything else, basically. We can just take our sample and say we have 500 units, so the end down here would be 500, and then we would have a certain distribution of those sample units. So this error matrix is interesting because it shows us errors of commission of forest loss. So in this case, we have observations in our sample that were classified as forest loss, but they were actually not forest loss according to the reference data. And we have errors of omission, where we omitted forest loss. So these were classified as being not forest loss, but in reality, they actually were forest loss. 
what we want to do, this this looks a bit funny here, um, is to estimate it. This is not terribly in this is not this is good information, but it's 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 it can be made much more informative by calculating the area proportions. Instead of saying that we have 12 errors of commission, I want to say that this corresponds to 1.5% of the total area of the map. We do that by calculating the estimated area proportions. And if we have done that, if we have this, if we have the estimated area proportions here, and it's very simple to do. Uh, we can easily construct a so-called bias-adjusted estimator or a model-assisted estimator. This is what explained in Sandow's book from 91. And it's a little bit hard to see here, but we get the area of force loss, the area of proportion, which is this guy down here, as the sum of the force loss according to the map plus the error of omission minus the error of commission. Right? So we have whatever the forest, the, the map gives us a certain area. We count the pixels mapped as forest loss. And then we subtract the error of commission, but we add the error of omission. That means that we have adjusted for the bias. This is a bias-adjusted estimator. There will be a variance estimator that goes along with these bias adjusted estimators, such that we can calculate a confidence interval around that. Um, another example is a stratified estimator, and this is what Remy will talk about. So here we take the area, the, the area of forest loss according to both the map and the reference data, which excludes the error of commission, and then we add in the error of omission, and we get the value down here. So again, we get the estimated area of force loss according to the reference data. So we get the exact same value. It's a little bit confusing. We get the exact same value in this case for these two estimators. But the variance will be different. There's a certain situation where the stratified estimator is more precise than the bias-adjusted estimator. And there are situations where the stratified estimator will give you a larger variance, a larger standard error. We provide some recommendations for when to use what in the medicine guidance document. It has to do if, if you're the map that you're using, if it if it's categorical, so each map is exactly one. Um, it's, it's exactly one. Um, one value or not, or if it's expressing like a, a percentage of deforestation, for example. If you have like a proportional map is expression proportion, then the bias adjusted estimator is typically better. So these are the two estimators that you will find in the literature for estimation of area. And, and it's bias adjusted and stratified. The stratified has the advantage that it allows you to use all the map classes as post strata. Um, so you can stratify based on all the classes in your map. Bias adjusted re requires to collapsing the information down to like a binary classification. Um, but this is intuitive in that it has actually an expression of the bias, and it's very efficient when the map classes are expressed in proportion. The stratified estimator is typically more efficient when the map classes are categorical. Um, and choosing among these areas estimators, there, there are papers written about that. Steve Stamen's paper from 2013, I think, is very good. And Ron wrote a paper, and then and the GFY document, the medicine guidance document from GFY, also provides some recommendations. Um, measures of accuracy, I'm not going to talk more about that. It's explained in a lot of these papers, and I'm pretty sure you're aware of it. We have overall accuracy, uses accuracy, and produces accuracy very, very easily calculated from the error matrix of area proportions. 
So to wrap up, all maps have errors. I think that's the most important take-home message from this, that all maps have errors. You cannot assume that the errors will somehow cancel the chatter out or anything. Maps have errors, so therefore you can't just simply count pixels by um, counting pixels on the map. That would not be IPCC compliant. We need to construct an S estimator, construct an unbiased estimator for, for estimation of area and to calculate the confidence interval. And, and, you know, there's been a lot of work done that allows you to do this. One thing that I probably should include here are like future direction and areas where it needs more work. And this is something we're working on. Um, so now we do a lot of time series analysis. So how can we apply these protocols in a time series perspective? That's a tricky topic that we're working on. And we're also seeing that when countries do this, the areas they're trying to estimate are very, very small. So a very common situation is that deforestation is like 1 or 2% of the area of the country. And then you have forest being 85, 90%. So any areas of omission of deforestation in one of those very large stratum, like forest, um, will carry a very large area weight. And, and will make the analysis and the inference tricky. So again, that is something we're working on. Um, so this is by no mean uh, um, an, a topic or an area where we have all the answers. There, there's still more work to be done there. And as we figure some of these out, we will publish it. And, and I think one of the most important forums is the methods and guidance document of GFY. Um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna write up modules when we find some of these things out. So so again, GFY is gonna be an important forum for finding information about or finding more recent advancement within this topic. And uh, I know I went a little bit above my time limit here, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. And and again, I see there's 172 people listening in, so I'm very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pontus, uh, for that very comprehensive overview of the topic. Um, now we're going to hand on to Remy. Um, so we're going to uh, show his screen in a minute. Hello. Hi, Remy. Hi, Sarah. Um, so I think now you should have uh, control of the webinar, Remy, and you can begin yes. your presentation when you're ready. Um, can you let me know if you see my screen? Yep, that's working fine. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Pontus, for that uh, that very great uh, theoretical background introduction. Um, it's a, it's a pleasure to demo and show the tools after after you talk. Um, I hope we'll be, we'll be uh, standing up to the level that you gave us. Um, first of all, I'd like to, to tell everyone, um, all the 172 attendees, um, to go and read uh, those papers that, uh, that Pontus has mentioned because they're, they're really worth it and they've really, they really helped us uh, go ahead with the development of those tools. Um, my name is Remy Danuncio. I work for the FAO um, at the Forestry Department in the UN Red Team. Uh, and I work as a GIS and remote sensing consultant. Before I start, I would like to thank the colleagues that have been working with us on the development of the tools, the application tools that we will present today. And I wish to thank uh, Yelena Feigold, Eric Lindquist, Daniel Veal, and Antonia Oltman for the support and, um, and help on, the, on those technical issues. Um, we have mainly developed the application, um, Yelena Feingold and I, uh, over the last year because we read those papers, those uh, great papers written by Pontus and by Steve Stemann uh, in 2013 and 2014, and we wanted to make um, applications that would help translate those papers into concrete tools. Um, so in the first step, we, we started writing up um, little scripts and little tools that would help us do that, and we realized that there were um, it was not that easy to actually do random stratified sampling of raster maps in the first place. Um, the reason why it's not that easy is exactly um, what Pontus has mentioned lately, is that 
most of the maps we are looking at in the red context, the change maps, uh, have very rare classes. So change, deforestation, degradation, restoration of forests, all these are very rare classes compared to the rest. And trying to produce in a standard GIS environment a random stratified sampling of these tools, of these classes, is difficult. So we had, we had developed some scripts and we realized they were not so handy, so we wanted we decided to use the shiny package of R to develop a graphical user uh, interface version of those tools. Um, so the tools that we present today are free and open source. Uh, they were developed under the Open Forest Initiative at the Forestry Department of FAO. Um, and uh, you can probably see my screen here with the, with the website to the Open Forest, uh, which is a platform for um, um, uh, of free and open source software tools to facilitate uh, forest data collection, analysis, and reporting. Um, so the, the tools we have developed um, are free and open source. They're available on GitHub. I believe Sarah and Jan can give you the link to those tools. But, um, and we have tested them under several platforms, um, actually under Windows, Mac, and Linux, and they all more or less work there. But we will demo them today in a platform called CEPAL. Uh, CEPAL is uh, a web-based platform um, that uh, stands for System for Auth Observation, Data Access, Processing, and Analysis of Land Nurturing. There will be a more complete introduction uh, next week on the seventh webinar of this series by Eric Lindquist, which will give a better overview of all the tools that are being developed in CEPAL. But uh, today we will use still the platform to demo the tools that we use. Um, you have received, if you registered to the webinar, a, uh, a little link to request access to the platform. So those who have done so and have registered already will be able to follow up with me as I'm uh, demoing the tool. And for the others, don't worry because you can register anytime and you can reproduce those steps that uh, we will show today. So, uh, with no further delay, I will uh, assume that people that have access to CEPAL can follow up with me and the others can watch and reproduce later on. Uh, all the steps are also included in a tutorial as a PDF that's available and uh, Sarah and Jan can share the link for that. So, how does it work? First of all, we log into the platform and we access Insight. As we can see, we have like four different types of tools, and we will see some of them next week. But for the moment, we focus on the process uh, part. And when we access the process, we see we have like different utilities. What we will do straightforward today is first look um, look at the at what uh, Pontus called the um, the sampling sampling design which is the first step of all this, uh, of this process, and we'll see how we construct a stratified sampling design. So click on, on, this, uh, on this button, and this will start a server. So you can see down there that it's waiting for the server to respond. It, uh, it sometimes takes like a couple of seconds, but usually comes up fairly quickly, I hope. So I just ask you for a little patience for the tool to come up. There we go. So that, it's an interesting exercise because it's the first time I'm doing this, uh, this uh, demonstration with so many people. So maybe the server is going to be a little slow in responding, but that's also exciting and interesting. Anyways, when we enter the tool, we have um, we have these um, this this first um, interface showing. Okay, and on the, and we see uh, different components. So the first component is the um, is actually an introduction where we can choose the language. So at the moment it exists in English, French, and Spanish. And if there's anyone willing to translate another language and to put the application, we're more than happy to have uh, other versions showing up. 
Uh, inside the introduction, you have a tab called Reference and Documents, where you can find the papers that I mentioned earlier by Pontus. Uh, we only put the 2014 one, but there's uh, plenty of papers that are related. We put this one because it's the most recent one on this particular subject, where you can find the reference to the others. Um, you also have the link to Red Compass and the different uh, IPCC um, guidelines that have been uh, summarized and explained in the Red context. Um, so we encourage you to go and look at these uh, papers and resources. Once you have started here, you can see you have five types on the left, and there is a there is a box here that says how to use the tool, and that explains to you that you have to go through each of the step one by one. So we start with the first step, which is uh, getting a map input, and um, we will see here that we need to first put our map as the stratification basis. So if I click on this at the moment, as you would have also in your environment, in your separate environments, I can see that my, my Docker is, uh, is empty because I don't have any data at the moment. So in order to showcase and to have everyone on the same page, we have created a little test map that we will use for the demo today. So you can first download the test data set and it will download from, um, from, from somewhere uh, a little test map that we can now use as an input. I will show you further on how you can use your own maps and how you can upload them in CEPAL. For the moment, I would encourage you to use um, this one. So now you have created a little folder called uh, SAE data test and you have a little map uh, that is being chosen there. So at that stage, you have selected your input map, you're ready to go to the second step. On the second step, you can here display the map that you've uh, inserted. And if I do that, I can see, okay, it's a little map, it's actually a map from Congo, and it's showing some features. We can see a river, we can see some forest pits, and we can see some uh, deforestation parts. Um, so as Pontus explained, um, what is important is to use in, in the stratified sampling approach, we want to use the map as a stratification and we need to know how much each of the strata weigh for the whole, um, for the whole um, calculation. So what we need to do in the first step is calculate the areas of each of the classes of the map. So we press on that button and here on area calculation and legend generation and it will automatically create a legend. Uh, so the legend has all the values of the map, uh, and because it's a raster map, the values are numerical uh, classes. So we have uh, we have designed a interface here where we can edit the classes, and I will do that by hand because uh, at the moment I assume that this is my map. I know what my map corresponds to, so I can say this is uh, so the first. Class number two is non-forest, the other one is water. Then we have different classes of forest. Um, and then we have different classes of loss. So I will put some, some names. Normally, if you have your own map, you should be able to know what are the different classes of your raster map. Whatever you choose to put in these classes, by default, you will have the numerical values. Um, Whatever you put, you can edit at any time, but you have to submit the legend. And when you submit the legend, you will see that the areas are showing for each of the classes. Right? So that's one step done, where you can see, um, where you can see all the areas in pixel count at that stage, because what we're interested in is the proportions of each of these strata over the whole area of interest. So now we can move to the third step, which will be the strata selection. Um, this has not been uh, uh, tackled uh, so far by Pontus, but um, it's very clearly explained in papers. And one of the parameters to determine the overall size of the sampling is um, the, um, the expected accuracy of each of the classes. In our particular case, where we have land cover change maps, we typically have um, stable classes 
for which we are expecting high um, user accuracy, and change classes for which we will expect lower user accuracy. And we can change here those levels uh, for each of those um, main, um, main components. We kept here the default values that are present in the papers, and I advise you to keep the same. But in any case, I will keep, I will put the stable classes of my map in the high confidence. So I will put non forest, water, and the three different forest classes inside. And then in the lower confidence with the lower expected user accuracy, I will put the change classes. And I just need to click on them like this. As you can see, here shows the edited map class um, that I, I edited in, in the previous step and not the, and not the numerical codes of the map itself. So once we have this, we can directly calculate the overall um, size of the sampling. The overall size of the sampling depends on a couple of parameters, and this formula has been shown before. This is the Cochrane 1977 formula for stratified uh, random sampling, um, which basically depends on the expected user accuracy of each, of each class, the weight of each class, which has been computed before when we calculated the pixel counts or the areas, and the standard error of the expected overall accuracy. Um, here we, we set the values as default, the same as in the different papers. Um, and we can also play with the minimum sampling size per strata. So if you remember well, um, Pons told you the reason why we're doing stratified sampling is that we can actually target those rare classes and we can have some, some of our samples falling on them. If we look on the column proportional here, we can see that with a sum over sampling size of 900, I will have only one point falling on this last class and zero point falling on this one. And this is because these classes are so rare. So we, we will not follow, obviously, proportional strictly, but we will impose a minimum sampling size per strata. By default, you have 100, but you can change those. And if you change those values here, you can see that the final sampling size will change automatically. So let's say, for instance, I take 50 at that stage. Um, this is this will be my final sampling size, so I can see that all the rare classes have the minimum, and then the rest is being allocated proportionally to the size of the main strata. All right, so at that stage, I have prepared all the parameters to draw my sampling. I have um, I've taken my map as an input. I've calculated the weight of each of the strata, and I'm ready to generate the sampling. And we can go to the last step of, um, of this process, and we can go to sample allocation, and we will generate the sampling points. So you have to press here on generate sampling points, and on the bottom right, you should see that um, the program is doing something. There is a progress bar showing up things and uh, moving forward. And uh, so we have a small map, so it goes quickly at the moment. But we can see that we have shot the, the different uh, points for the different classes, and uh, that they are available um, here. And we can see that we have sampled the river, for instance, here, or some of the loss that was, um, that was concentrated here. So now our sampling is finished, um, and we can export this to use into a, a response design. So Pontus explained to us before that we have three steps. The first step is to do a sampling. The second step is to collect data, reference data, for each of the points of this sampling. Um, one of the tools we have developed under the Open Forest Initiative is uh, also a tool for collecting data. Um, and this is not the subject of today's webinar, but I just want to show you that the tools that we have created connect to these other tools. So in that particular case, um, I know I'm in the Republic of Congo, and um, I can put some auxiliary data that will be used in the collectors because that's the, that's the interface we have chosen to, 
to collect reference data. Um, and I can directly, I can change my base name because that's going to be the, the file name I'm going to have later on. So I can call it, for instance, Congo Webinar uh, Collectors 2017-06-06. That's the date of today. And I can directly download as a collector project. Um, so this will um, download administrative boundaries and uh, additional uh, information about elevation, slope, and aspect of each point. And the result of that is um, the what we have here on the bottom left is a collector project. So, like I said, it's a very important part of the work. It's like the second step of the whole accuracy assessment process, collecting the reference data. But it's not the scope of today. But uh, I just want to show you that once you have finished this sampling here, if you have installed um, the tool that's necessary for it, you will be able to directly see in Google Earth each of the samples that you have chosen. And for each of those samples, you can access the very high special resolution imagery that is available in Google Earth. So here we fall on the river, for instance, and here we fall on forest. Um, and for each of those points, we will be able to directly see the name of the classes that we have set up before. So we have here a very quick um, way to use the classes that we have from the map and try to interpret them using very high uh, special resolution imagery. We have also, uh, I, I fully agree with what Pontus said before, that we need to combine high spatial resolution imagery and high temporal resolution when we look, uh, look at change data. And we have also developed some uh, other functionalities to create time series, for instance. Um, time series that would look like this, um, that would look like uh, like uh, several steps of uh, Landsat and Sentinel imagery, where we don't necessarily have very high spatial resolution, but we have like one image per year, or even even more than that if we can, and we can follow what's happening to our red points in the center throughout time. And we can see that here we had like forest in one point, and then it starts to deteriorate, and then it's being completely cut down at some point. Anyway, um, this is not the point of the webinar today to work on the response design, but we have developed these kinds of tools, and uh, we've been working in FAO to provide help to countries to develop and, uh, and uh, construct these tools themselves. Um, these uh, time series and um, high resolution uh, spatial imagery will soon be available. Um, actually, time series is already available in CEPAL, and, um, and the demo version for the collector online will come up also extremely soon, and we will be able to do all this in the platform. Anyway, so let me, allow me to close that parenthesis on response design. And um, let me show you now how we can do the same process with your own data, how you can upload your own map into CEPAL. I guess I still have 20 minutes. I'm still good. Yeah, put on. So um, we have uh, different ways of uh, loading data into CEPAL, but the easiest way is still to be in the process part and to go to RStudio and to use the upload function of RStudio here to load your own data. Um, you may have to register when you enter for the first time in RStudio. I registered before, so. It didn't show me the, the screen, but uh, if you have this, you just need to put your username and password. In any case, here you have an upload function where you can choose files. And so in that case, I will upload uh, maps and data that is on my computer, and I will upload it into my virtual workspace in CEPAL. Um, if you have a single file, you can upload it as is. And if you have several, like in the case of a shape file, for instance, you should zip it before and load it directly as a zip, and it will unzip it immediately. So I'll do that with you. I have, I have like one map that I have prepared on my computer. 
I want to use it in SEPA and I want to use it for the um, stratified area estimation and create sampling on it. So I will use the upload. And you can see now that in your workspace, you have a map showing up. And if I go back to CEPAL now, I will be able to see that same map as an input available. And I will be able to reproduce the same process. Uh, in that particular case, I now have a shape file that I want to use. And I could use that to go on and to do the same, uh, same process. If you are loading a shapefile or any vector-based data, you will need to specify which column of your database file is, um, uh, is uh, um, having the columns uh, of your classes. So you have to specify that here because the program doesn't know by itself. In a raster, um, in a raster discrete map, it's fairly easy because there's only usually only one band. But in a, in a vector-based um, data, you would need to specify that. So in, in my case, I have a, a column called class change. And if I use that and I do the area calculation, I will see now I have directly the names of the different classes, and it's a different map. OK? So now I have uh, uploaded a, a vector base map that you can see here in a different place. And the process is the same further on. So I will not, uh, I will not uh, hinder any more on this. Um, this, was the first, uh, this was the first step of the whole uh, process and how it, how it works to create the sampling design. I very briefly showed you that you can collect data uh, in some of our tools, but you can actually use any um, pertinent and uh, consistent data to complement um, um, the, way, the way you collect the reference data. Collection of reference data is very important and will have a huge impact on the quality of your results. Um, but, and there's plenty of way to do so. And you can use uh, um, permanent sample plots, for instance. If you have them, you can use repetitive national forest inventories. You can do plenty of things. But um, what, what we will focus on here at the moment is the, what is before that step. So that's the uh, design, the sampling design creation. So we've seen this. And now we will assume that we have collected reference data, that we already have them, and we have also created the module for analysis. And this, uh, this is the third step that Pontus explained earlier. And um, it, we, will, we will use that to create the confusion matrix, the different producer and user accuracy, and most importantly, to um, create the stratified area estimates and confidence intervals around them. So if you are still with me, I would uh, encourage you to go, to, to go back using those buttons here, uh, to go back to the process tools, and we can start the analysis. So again, the server might take some seconds to start. It's fairly quick at the moment. Um, so. You can see that it's the same um, introduction interface. Um, we have uh, it's it's the same uh, it's the same information that's available. You can see that we have like less steps here. And on the on the sampling design, we had like five steps to create the whole sampling, and then that stage we have uh, it's a much quicker one. Again, you can choose your language. Um, so let me go straight to the inputs. So. This is, the, this is the important part. Um, what we need to create the confusion matrix and to produce the area estimates and the confidence intervals that Pontus explained earlier on is two things. We need one file that tells us for each of the points of the sampling design what is the map information and what is the reference information. So we need the simplest form of that is a a um, text file or an Excel spreadsheet, for instance, which will have uh, one column with the map information and one column with the reference data information. Um, in our particular case, we need the data to be in CSV form, but it can be any CSV file that has these two columns available. In our case, we can see that um, when I created the, 
the oh, sorry. When I created the the first um, the first map in the first place, when I used the first ma the map in the sampling design, sorry, um, next to my map, still in my Sepal environment, I created um, a folder that contains all the information related to the sampling. So I have the size of the sampling, I have the different options I've chosen for the different parameters, and we have also created a mock-up data so that we can illustrate the analysis part. So this mock-up data, here the collected data mock-up Congo webinar, it has the name uh, that we choose for the base name, and it contains the different information from different points. In that case, it simulates some fake reference data by introducing um, some errors um, randomly. Okay, so this is not real data, but this is just for the purpose of the demo. So I will select my file that contains my reference information, my map information. I can see here I have two new fields coming up. The second and last thing that I need for the analysis is to fill in, again, the area of each strata. And these areas have been calculated in the first step. They could come from anywhere else if you wanted to calculate outside of the box. As long as you provide a CSV file that contains the name of each of your classes and the areas uh, of, of the classes, you're good to go. Um, and uh, I'm pretty much done um, at that stage. I can check that I have the coordinates of my points showing on the right map. Here is fine. And then if I click on the results, I will automatically generate the confusion matrix that, uh, that uh, Pontus showed us before. And um, the associated producer accuracy, user accuracy, and the, the area estimates, which are here, stratified random area estimates and the confidence intervals that go around them. Um, so we can see on this graph that we have like uh, several, uh, several information. Um, we actually have like three types of bars. We have the map pixel count, which is the direct count of pixels from the map. That's the area of each strata. We have the stratified random estimates, which is here in black in the center with the confidence interval uh, showing around. And we have also included for um, recent developments, we are trying to compare uh, if we had a proper post-stratification schema, what would the simple random uh, give us? In our case, it, the simple random will give us the proportions that we, we shot in the first place, the, the, the size of each strata. So we can see that all the rare classes are fairly much the same because we all gave them the same number of points and the bigger classes have bigger uh, areas because this is proportional to, to the sampling in the first place. What is interesting here is the size of the confidence interval of the simple random compared to the stratified random. In any case, don't worry too much about those two. Um, this graphic here is just for information and illustration. What is important is that you can download the confusion matrix here and the producer and user accuracy with the stratified random area estimates and confidence interval coming with them. Let me, let me finally show you that if we change here some of those, um, those names in the columns, we can, uh, we can check some more data. So you remember I had, uh, I had edited the, the names of the classes of my map, right? So I had, I had codes in my raster data and I translated them into real names of classes. I can use those columns, and this is an illustration that you can use any kind of CSV file that you can fit in the analysis here. Um, so I will use the ref class and the map class. I had ref code and map code in the first place. And I can see that I will generate the same kind of data, but instead of having the codes from the raster here, I have the edited map class. And I can go ahead. Hi, Rami. Just to quickly interrupt you, if you yes, can finish please. in a couple of minutes, that would be great. Thanks. I have I have finished now. Um, that's the last step. All you need to do um, to obtain your data is 
to click on those buttons and you will see here you download uh, the confusion matrix as a CSV file and you download also the area estimates as a CSV file and I'll just open it for sake and you can see you have um, you have data with user accuracy here uh, produce weighted producer accuracy um, and the different uh, areas in the same unit that was uh, that was used for the map and I have finished at that stage and I'm really happy I, I thanked my colleagues in the first place um, I hope that was all clear and I'm uh, very looking forward to questions great um... Thanks, Remy, uh, for giving that um, excellent presentation of the CEPAL system. Like uh, you've been told already, um, we can uh, hear more about the CEPAL system next week. We don't have very much time, um, so thank you for all those people who have given in their questions already. Um, Pontus, I'm going to go straight to you with a question, um, if that's okay with you. Um, can you unmute? Can you just tell us, um, because we've got a lot of people listening in who are um, implementing RED projects, they have data coming in from different sources, um, the different sources of data have different levels of accuracy, the reference data maybe has some uncertainties associated with it. What's, can you give us some top tips when people are dealing with these kind of data sources and how they can implement uh, the, some of the things that you've mentioned about how to account for all these accuracies in a, a project with all these things going on? Perhaps you can just say something about that quickly. Uh, yeah, thanks. I, first of all, when it comes to the stratification of the landscape, there you have a lot of freedom. You can stratify any way you want. Any way that makes sense, you can combine different maps, you can use bits and pieces from various maps, and, and there you have a lot of freedom. When it comes to the reference sample, that has to be collected by probability sampling. So you have to collect it by, by one of these sampling designs that I talked about, um, and you can't... It, it's very, very difficult to combine samples from, from, um, that are collected in, with different types of, of designs. So combining a cluster-based sample with a stratified is going to be very tricky. So there you don't have a lot of freedom. Um, you have to make sure that, that the area, the sampling frame, covers the whole population that you want to make inference about. And then you have to somehow sample that by probability sampling. And, and, and so simple random sampling, um, systematic sampling, stratified random and cluster-based, all of those are probability sampling. Um, and, and in the papers that I mentioned, there are the definitions of what probability sampling means. So there you don't have a lot of freedom, but when you create a stratification, or how you stratify your, your study area. There you, that you can do in any way you want. Okay, great. Thanks, Pontus. Um, Remy, we have a, a question for you um, from Gregory Taff, who's asking us, how many reference samples uh, per class should we have? Because we saw in your example that you could choose the minimum number of samples per class. So are there any hard and fast rules that we can follow for this? Or um, do you kind of use your expert judgment in some way? Can you maybe uh, say something about that? Yeah, I yeah for sure I can try I can try to answer. Um, if if I say anything stupid, maybe Pontus can correct me. But um, the idea behind um, random uh, random stratified sampling is that you can afford to throw away some of the information if you don't have uh, good enough information. Like I said before, the quality of the reference data is paramount to the quality of the results. So you have to be sure that your reference data is as close as possible to perfect. One of the advantages of random stratified sampling is that you can allow yourself to throw away a little bit of them, not too many, but um, you, you have some flexibility there. So what is being um, recommended in Pontus' paper is to use at least um, 
50 or 75, I can't remember uh, what's in the in the papers, and we put by default 100 because um, we we if if we do so and if we have the time and resources, then we have more possibility to throw away some points without changing too much the results or um, and waiting um, like modifying the results. So it's it's always it's always. Uh, uh, some kind of experience-based information, but the reason why we set those values is to have enough uh, enough samples to represent everything. I don't know if there's an absolute minimum. Um, some people say you need at least 30 points to have um, anything relevant in uh, normal distributions. So I would say don't go below 30, but um, and just try to take more so that the more points you have, the better. Um, the more points you have, the better. You cannot harm your data set by adding more points. Um, you just have to try to be as close as possible to proportional in order not to de deviate. But uh, yeah, that would be my answer. Just uh, try to be at least at 30 and take more so that you can be safe. And if you are not sure about your information on those points, you allow yourself to throw them away. Thanks, Remy. Pontus, do you have anything very quick to add to that? And if uh, not, we'll... Yeah, sorry. I think the 50 number comes from the paper that I wrote, and, and it's, it's not set in stone. Uh, it's, it's usually more important, uh, you know, in this context, when you do have very large strata, and then you have some very small one that you're trying to estimate, the, the allocation of the sample to those large strata is often more important. Um, I should just mention that you should be very careful about throwing away sample units. Um, every, whenever you do that, you are violating um, the, uh, the the rules of probability sampling. So that that should you should try to not do that. I remember Steve Stamen once said that you can you should maintain at least eighty five percent of the original sample, and I, I really like that because it was a very tangible, clear number. And I asked him if I could quote him on that, and he said no. And he took it out of his his manuscript draft, so he didn't want to stand by that. So that's a, that's a, that's a tricky concept. That's a tricky topic, and again, it's very hard to to give an exact number. But but you should really try to not. Um, the, the 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 rules of probability sampling is that each pixel or each element of the of the population has to have a probability of being included in the sample that is above zero so um, if there are certain areas that are very very cloudy and you just can't get any reference observation you're in, in in some ways you're actually violating the rules of probability sampling so that should be done um, or that should not be done <laughs> or you should try to avoid it to to as much as you can Thanks, Pontus. There's a lot of these things. There's no, there's no definite answers, and you know, minimum sampling units and all of those things. That um, twenty, I've seen twenty, thirty, fifty. I don't think there's any, any, any magical number. Okay, great. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut um, everyone off there because we are running out of time. Thanks, everyone, for joining the webinar. Um, we hope it's been useful for you. Um, and we hope that we can see you in exactly one week from now, um, minus one and a half hours. Uh, so that's 3 p.m. Uh, Central European Standard Time, the same time as today, Tuesday the 13th of June. And we'll follow on um, with a more in-depth uh, view of the CEPOL system. If your question wasn't answered today, please, and you, you still want some more information on the topic, please do send me an email and we'll try our best to answer it for you. Um, thanks again to the presenters, Pontus and Remy, um, and see you all next week.